take an hour this afternoon and be able to study the history of World War II. We are grateful especially to be able to study it within the context of the restored gospel. We ask that thou please help us clear our minds that we'll be able to concentrate on these things and be able to learn things that will help us better our lives. We are grateful for our living prophet and ask as always to watch over and protect him. Please bless the missionaries out in the mission field that they also may be watched over and protected and be blessed for their efforts. We ask for thy spirit to be with us here in class today as we learn of these important historical moments and we say these things in the name of our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks a lot, Heidi. Okie dokie. Well, so today um, our class uh, is going to be split into two different sections. Uh, the first half of the class, uh, we are going to uh, look at the context um, around the world and a lot of different things going uh, that will help set the stage uh, for World War II and that will begin World War II. Uh, and then the second half, we're going to have um, our usual 4 r discussion uh, with the reasoning and relating questions based um, on the primary documents uh, uh, as well as lots of wonderful uh, relating questions um, and uh, scriptures and words of the prophets uh, to help us try to make sense of everything. So I figured it would be hard to, to discuss it well if we didn't have that context first just because we have so many things going on all around the world. So, okay, welcome Wendy, how are you? Hi, I'm doing well, thanks. Good, good. Hi Christina, how are you? Hello Christina, can you hear us? Now I can. Oh, okay, great. Well, great. So uh, we'll talk about uh, the beginning of World War II then. Uh, we'll look at German and Japanese aggression as well as uh, what was going on in a lot of other places um, from the 1930s through 1940. So here we go. Um, and, and as I said, just this for uh, Wendy and Christina, our class is going to be split into two sections today. The first section, I'll provide some context that will really help us to have some meaningful discussion. Um, in the second half of our class, which will uh, be our um, 4 r um from the documents. Uh, it should be great. So if we look at German aggression, it's very, very interesting uh, to try to make sense of this all. Um, and, and truly, this was just such a, such a world war, uh, as we'll see uh, through these, through these uh, slides of context. Um, soon after becoming the German chancellor, right, the leader um, of, uh, of Germany, um, and uh, you know, abolishing democracy, uh, governing by decree, uh, in 1933, Hitler pulled Germany from the League of Nations. Uh, in 1935, Hitler announced to the world that he would openly defy the Treaty of Versailles um, by beginning um, a draft, by building up Germany's army and navy against um, the, the wishes uh, and the demands of the treaty, uh, and also creating an air force, which the treaty had uh, forbade. Uh, Britain, France, uh, the United States, right? nobody did anything. They did nothing. Um, emboldened by German aggression, Italy always sort of the second place, always kind of nipping at the heels of a, of a larger power. Um, Italy invaded independent Ethiopia in 1935. Um, uh, and in fact, my, uh, my great uh, uncle, uh, my grandfather's brother, uh, actually um, was drafted uh, and uh, fought uh, in, uh, in Ethiopia uh, at this time. Uh, in 1936, Hitler poured troops into the Rhineland. If we remember, the Rhineland had been demilitarized. It was supposed to be this buffer state um, on the borders of France and Belgium. Uh, 1938, Hitler invaded Austria, which accepted the annexation without protest because they, be they believed in Hitler's pan-Germanism. They were both uh, Germanophones, meaning German-speaking peoples. Um, and so they thought, well, hey, you know, we, we fought together in World War I, um, and uh, we're coming together now. Maybe this will be a good thing for Austria. We'll gain more power, and we'll rise with the Aryan race as they take their place um, in the world. Um, also, Hitler went into a small region of Czechoslovakia that was predominantly uh, Germanophone or German-speaking, um, called the Sudetenland, um, and he was able to uh, occupy that without uh, much protest because, uh, as I said, most of the people there were uh, German speakers and supported Germany. Uh, also in 1938, uh, Hitler caused uh, the, the famous event called Kristallnacht, uh, or uh, li literally uh, sort of, you know, uh, crystal and then night, uh, or what, what we know it as in English, uh, the night of the broken glass. Um, and this was a massive movement of violence uh, against Jews uh, where we start to see for the first time this mass roundup. Uh, we, it started with an assassination of a, uh, a Jewish leader, uh, and then we start to see Jews being um, uh, hoarded um, into, uh, into prison camps, uh, you know, arrested without cause, uh, etc. 
it occurred in Germany and Austria, and, and most historians view it as sort of the beginning of the Holocaust. Uh, so that's 1938. Uh, 1939, then, this is where things start to really speed up, and we start to see German aggression um, starting to take action against other countries in an even bigger way. Uh, Germany took over the rest of Czechoslovakia. Remember, they conquered the Sudetenland, and now they took the rest of it. Uh, they signed a pact with Italy to form the Axis powers. This would be the Pact of Steel. Uh, they'd also signed, interestingly enough, a pact with the USSR um, because Hitler did not want, once again, he's always worried Germany's in the middle um, of these two great powers, France uh, and the USSR. He didn't want to fight a two-front war, and so he figured if he could focus his attention on France, um, which uh, had an army uh, that was um, even bigger um, at this point and would be equally as big by the time that Hitler was ready to move into France, um, he figured if he could focus on France, take care of them, and not have to worry about Stalin, uh, that that would give him a, a good chance at dominating Western Europe in the way that he hoped to. Uh, and so with this, he signed this interesting pact in which he said, okay, USSR, um, at the end of World War I, Poland uh, was reconstituted. It was taken uh, from land, uh, both German and uh, Russian land. And so because of that, we both have an interest in taking it back. So let's both sign an agreement that we won't fight each other, but we'll fight against Poland. Uh, and so that was able to be uh, sort of a boon for Stalin because he wasn't prepared uh, to fight Hitler yet. And so he needed a couple years to build up his forces before he could then come in against Hitler on the side of the Allies. But at this point in the war, it's important to, uh, or in the oncoming war, it's important to realize that uh, Stalin was thinking of his own interests, uh, and he wanted part of Poland. Hitler did too, and so they actually were working together on this uh, joint venture. And then Hitler would invade Poland first, um, the USSR would later. Uh, and Poland, perhaps more than any other country, was just decimated by World War II. Just an absolute wreck. Uh, very sad story. Well, September 1939, uh, France and Britain finally responded to all that was going on um, in Germany. Um, and they declared war. Uh, also, the U.S. Um, officially proclaimed neutrality, but decided to back the Allies uh, by sending supplies. And so that's sort of um, what's going on here. It's interesting. There's this concept of appeasement that we see because, you know, you may have noticed that um, France and Britain um, and other nations uh, that, that could have stood up against Germany as it was um, escalating its aggression really didn't do much. Uh, if anything, they said, hey, we protest. This isn't fair. This isn't good. The League of Nations kind of said, poo-poo to you. Uh, you know, we hope you stop. Um, but really didn't do much else. Um, but, there, you know, we have to think to ourselves, what would the reasons be? Uh, and, you know, I'm sure you, maybe you've been scanning through these reasons, but do you see any reasons why you personally, and maybe it includes one of these, you know, why any reasons why uh, you might have favored appeasement, basically just kind of hoping Germany would go away and just giving them what they wanted and not trying to uh, to do anything about it? Why appeasement? Was there any guilt about the the uh, Versailles Treaty? Um, I haven't read about any guilt, but perhaps there was some that was felt. Um, certainly not among the, the major leaders. So they weren't trying to compensate for something then? Right, not, not, not in anything that I've read, certainly. I think, I don't know, I, I might hope that people within the country of Germany themselves would be dissatisfied enough that they would destroy Hitler from within without another, our country, having to be involved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which I know sure. did happen. There were several assassination attempts and... Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm not saying necessarily kill him, but somehow get him out of power that, that those within the own country would be upset about it enough to do something about it. Sure. Yeah, so ho hopefully the problem could be solved internally rather than externally. Yeah. yeah. Great. Great point, Heidi. Well, you know, um, most of all, um, World War I had just um, wreaked havoc on the psyche, uh, you know, of these nations. They just were so afraid of another war because World War I had been so just utterly... Uh, you know, decimating. Uh, and so there was this visceral fear, you know, of, of having that happen again. And so they tried to put it off as long as possible and as long as possible. Uh, you know, some might say that by not doing anything, they actually made it worse. Uh, you know, of course, it's up for debate. Um, but they were afraid of it. Uh, also, interestingly enough, at this time, the world over, uh, the world was more afraid of Stalin than they were of Hitler. Uh, because Stalin openly proclaimed um, that he hated Christianity, he would attack Christianity, that he attacked private property, whereas Hitler was more of a slippery fellow. Um, and depending on who he spoke to, he might say something different, and lots of people didn't have the full story. 
Uh, and so he would claim or feign respect for Christianity uh, and private property um, on one hand. And so people really thought, you know, yeah, maybe he's not a good guy, um, but we really think that we should be more worried about Stalin. And so because they were worried about Stalin, uh, Great Britain and France then couldn't <laughs> to sign another alliance um, like the Triple Entente that they had signed, you know, before World War I. Now, if they had signed this alliance, of course, this is, you know, counterfactual history, just people wondering what, what could have happened. Um, you know, it could have been a great counterweight uh, to Germany and, and, and may have, may have um, stopped Germans, uh, Germany's aggression. Um, but nevertheless, they didn't do it. Uh, and so there wasn't a counterweight. And so Germany was really able to just roll forth uh, with its aggression, unimpeded. Uh, there was also a great naivete um, about fascist tactics. And so Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of Britain for Winston Churchill, uh, he was a man of his word, and he believed that Hitler was too. Um, and he truly thought that when Hitler said that he would only incorporate Germanophones, German-speaking countries, he felt that he meant it. And so he didn't fear for any other countries and figured, no, well, you know, if he wants to create this pan-German empire, well, you know, that's really not our deal. We'll, we'll, we'll see where he goes with it. Um, but, you know, we don't need to do anything about it at this point. So, you know, we'll take him on his word. You know, we see, we see where that uh, may, have, may have led. Um, well, if we look to Japan then, because, of course, I think we're a lot more familiar uh, with sort of what was going on in Europe at this time. You know, we, we, we know the, the old stories about fascism um, and Nazism uh, and communism. Uh, and we know about Hitler and we know about Mussolini. We know about Stalin and how they were building up their uh, various um, totalitarian states uh, in Europe. Um, but um, Japan might be more um, of an enigma to us. And so I have uh, a few more slides on, on Japanese aggression, on what the, on what the Japanese did uh, to become this industrial, um, industrial power that uh, would be um, an ally of, of Hitler's um, in, uh, in the war. Well, if we go back all the way to 1868, um, we have the Tokugawa shogunate, right, this group of, of shoguns, group of rulers uh, that were sanctioned, uh, you know, by, by an emperor, um, crumbling. And we see in their place a group of young, ambitious, um, forward-thinking rulers um, who would uh, create what's known as the Meiji Restoration, uh, which would set Japan on a course of centralization, so centralized government, statism, uh, industrialization, uh, and then imperialism. So we start to see Japan from um, 1868 onward looking a lot more like a European nation. And they were the first in Asia to do this. And so this was a huge deal. And it would change the, the balance of power in Asia uh, almost forevermore, you could say. Um, subjects uh, within the Empire of Japan also, and, and you've read uh, perhaps a little bit of this document here from which I, I quote, right, they were rigidly expected to be loyal to the emperor in disregard of self, thereby supporting the imperial throne, coextensive with the heavens and the earth. Um, you read this, this, uh, this quote in uh, the uh, Japanese Ministry of Education document that I had uh, an excerpt uh, of for you. Uh, as they continued, right, looking at how Japan was this centralized government under an emperor and what that meant, they explained that to serve the emperor is the great duty's key point. Our lives will be sincere and true when they are offered to the emperor and the state, close quote. And uh, just as, as a, an important note, one of the reasons why they, they felt this great allegiance uh, to the emperor was uh, because, according to the Shinto religion, the emperor was believed to be a god incarnate, so a god on earth, a god in flesh, uh, and then a descendant of the gods. Uh, and so he um, was, was akin to deity, uh, and they treated him as such. Well, um, it's interesting to note that, uh, of course, we've talked about new imperialism, right? And, and, you know, and I, could have, I could have included um, Jap Japan in, in that, and, um, you know, many people do, but I thought I'd save it for here because it maybe fit a little bit more uh, with, uh, with our chronology. Uh, and so if we look at, that, look at Japanese imperialism um, in Taiwan and Korea and Manchuria, uh, it's very interesting to note that, you know, really Japan didn't have too many countries to choose from because the Europeans had done such a great job and the Americans taking, you know, the large Philippines and some other islands in the Pacific, et cetera. Um, but they were able to build up this empire um, that would include um, Taiwan, Korea, territories in northern China, including um, Manchuria, which is the uh, sort of northeastern arm of uh, greater China that sprawls up and to the right uh, and then uh, abuts the USSR. Um, well, uh, as Japan was doing this, of course, we have the Great Depression, right, this global depression that would affect the whole world. It hits Japan as well uh, as Japan is industrializing and um, um, is, uh, is affected by these capitalist uh, swings in, in market, global markets. 
Uh, well, uh, they saw conquering greater China with its huge, just vast, right, human and natural resources uh, as the answer to their economic woes. They said, hey, we'll solve our Great Depression by conquering China. And so they always had this as a plan in the back of their minds. Uh, and so we'll see how this ended up spinning out over the course of time. Well, 1931, we have this very famous incident called the Manchurian Incident. Of course, it occurred in Manchuria. Um, and it's neat to see how it happened, um, because it just sort of goes to show you that you know, um, people end up doing what they want. <laughs> um, well, threatened by the growing power in China of the authoritarian anti-communist uh, Guomindang movement, and we, we may be familiar with this because it'll be, uh, the U.S. will be sympathetic to it uh, during the Cold War after uh, the Guomindang uh, moved to Taiwan under uh, Chiang Kai-shek's leadership. Uh, anyway, but um, we see Japanese soldiers along Japan's Manchurian Railroad in northeastern China right, um, react to an explosion on the southern line of this railroad. Now, um, of course, it's, it's uh, almost impossible to know for sure, but most historians agree that the Japanese staged this explosion. Um, and by doing that, they were, then gave themselves the excuse to conquer the rest of the province of Manchuria uh, and then they would rename it uh, Manchukuo. Uh, anyway, the League of Na Nations, of course, always very weak, you know, idealistic, um, can't really do too much um, to really stop war, um, can do a lot to sort of incite it in some ways. Um, but, you know, of course, they protest. And so the only thing Japan does is just, oh, okay, you protest, we'll leave. So they leave the League, um, just like Hitler did. Um, well, after the Manchurian incident, it really sort of sets Japan on this crash course um, towards becoming uh, one of the Axis powers. Uh, as we see, because just like uh, Hitler did, uh, Japan starts to increase its production of heavy industries needed for even greater expansion, namely the conquering of greater China, because right now they only have Manchuria. Um, as it does so, right, the state grows more severely authoritarian. Uh, it starts to divert, just like Hitler did, um, an increasingly large amount of economic production to the building up of its military, especially warships. Um, we see political protesters thrown in jail. Uh, conservative politicians are assassinated by young uh, military leaders. And then we see military officials begin to replace civilian leaders. And so we start to see the marshalization of the Japanese state, uh, which, of course, doesn't bode well. Well, um, biggest of all, then, um, I'm not sure how much you know about this, but this was an incredibly important event in, e in East Asia and really for the world, the Sino-Japanese War, Sino meaning Chinese. Uh, the Chinese-Japanese War uh, from 37 all the way through the end of World War II in 1945, but it began in 1937. Um, and really, we start to see once again these sort of young officers who are headstrong um, and rash uh, taking matters into their own hands, just as, as they, they likely did in the Manchurian incident. Uh, they were frustrated by years of indecision by their superiors. They wanted to get on with this plan to just conquer greater China um, and uh, increase Japan's power in the world. And so um, in uh, July of 37, uh, junior Japanese officers forced an attack on Greater China by assaulting Beijing. Um, the, the attack would quickly win the support of the superior officers as well as the Japanese government. Um, and then Japan would see a string of huge victories. Uh, Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, other coastal cities fell into their grasp. Uh, the Japanese Navy would then blockade the entire Chinese coast. Um, they couldn't get any aid in to help them. Uh, Japanese planes bombed Nanjing, also known as uh, Nanking, um, as well as Hankou uh, and Canton. Um, well, the Chinese forces lost every battle. Uh, they, just, they were no match for industrial Japan. Uh, they were ill-equipped, poorly trained. Uh, within a year, Japan had brought all of the coastal provinces and the lower Yangtze and Yellow River Valleys into China's most, popul excuse me, China's most populous regions into submission. So even though, of course, there were other regions of China, uh, they uh, took the heart and soul. Uh, they took the, most of the resources, uh, human and material, uh, and, and they accomplished their objective. Well, as this was going on, we started to see communist guerrilla forces putting up a fight, uh, a fight very, very similar to that that would be waged um, by uh, the, uh, the Vietnamese, uh, the Viet Cong um, during the Vietnam, the Vietnam um, conflict. Well, we see guerrilla forces um, who were led um, by leaders like Mao Zedong uh, who carry on insurgent operations that thwart Japanese efforts for the total control that they wanted. Uh, and they create this quagmire, this sort of you know, unsolvable problem, this muck that people can't get out of, right? That sort of drip by drip drained Japan of resources, both human and material, and really uh, was sort of a, a, just a thorn in their side that they couldn't get rid of. Um, also, this war was marked by unimaginable violence. 
uh, and destruction. Uh, in the winter of uh, 37 and 38 alone, right, the city of Nanking, uh, or Nanjing, um, uh, we see the Japanese uh, violating the chastity, of, uh, and this is uh, something that they willfully did. This is 20,000 women. Uh, they murdered 200,000 prisoners and civilians, uh, and they looted and burned massive amounts of public and private structures. Well, the Chinese, uh, what did they have to fight back? Well, they had natural resources, and so they, they tried a gamble, which was to use the power of the Yellow River that they'd harnessed through creating dams and dikes um, against the Japanese, uh, hoping to slow them down. Uh, and so they purposefully burst the Yellow River dikes to cause a flood, but this flood was one of the greatest uh, disasters caused by a natural force in the entire um, 20th century, if not you know, history, um, modern history. Anyway, the flood would destroy 4,000 Chinese villages, dispossess 12 and a half million people of their homes, and then result in the deaths of almost 900,000 people. Uh, so this was just devastating. Uh, it didn't do as much as they'd hoped to stop the Japanese either. Um, well, while we see uh, the Japanese and Chinese fighting against each other, we also see uh, the Kuomintang fighting against the Japanese and the communists fighting against the Japanese and the Kuomintang fighting against the communists and vice versa. And so we have a lot going on at once. And so uh, while the Sino-Japanese War is raging, uh, we start to see these two groups, the Kuomintang and the communists, battling for the hearts and minds of the Chinese. And uh, we see that Mao Zedong uh, became increasingly popular with China's dispossessed and overburdened peasants. Uh, so, uh, of course, this is foreshadowing the ultimate um, communist victory um, in, uh, in China over Chiang Kai-shek's uh, Kuomintang uh, in 1949 when uh, Chiang Kai-shek would then flee to Taiwan. Well, if we look at the fall of France, once again, um, lots of great information to provide context that will hopefully help really enrich our discussions and give us uh, some meat to chew on as, as we get to our 4 r in uh, just a couple minutes. Um, if we look at the fall of France, now this was one of the great disasters uh, and disappointments um, of, of Western Europe uh, and in, in this war because uh, of, of the uh, ineptness of France. Uh, after conquering Poland, Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands, and Belgium in a combined only three months, only three months, right, Hitler turned his attention to France. Uh, he used the uh, blitzkrieg tactics, uh, you know, lightning warfare, uh, in which fast-moving tanks and armored cars ruled the day. Uh, you know, it's interesting because the France had stuck the Maginot Line uh, to stop um, Germany from, from uh, advancing, uh, but uh, these fast-moving tanks were able to get through uh, places that the French thought they wouldn't be able to get through, and so really where their defenses were the weakest, right? Isn't that always the way that we see it? Isn't that the way that Satan works with us, where our defenses are the weakest? They broke through, uh, and in only six weeks, uh, 10th of May to the 22nd or 25th of June, depending on when you want to count it, um, France was done. Um, by the summer of 1940, then, Germany established an occupation army in more than half France uh, and assented to the creation of a new puppet regime, the Vichy government, headed by Marshal Pétain, uh, which collaborated with Hitler in ruling the free zone of France. We'll talk more about that uh, in our foreign in, in a moment. Uh, we see Charles de Gaulle um, become the leader of the free French, who were fighting uh, French forces outside of France. Uh, they continue to fight the Axis that way, while uh, inside France we see the resistance become uh, increasingly effective as an underground network of militant liberationists who try to undermine uh, Germany from within. Well, we have uh, one of the most stirring parts of uh, the beginning of the war as we see Britain fighting alone, uh, all alone, France is gone, uh, despite having an army equal in size to Germany, but it's out of commission now. And, um, you know, Britain was able to uh, take some of their troops back after the, the French Battle of Dunkirk, bring them back home, um, but didn't have much of an army to speak of uh, at that point. And so we start to see um, Germany straddling Europe all the way from Russia to Spain, between Russia and Spain. Um, and we start to see Britain, though, with a couple advantages of its own. It has the Royal Navy, a skilled Royal Air Force, and then a new prime minister who on, uh, uh, in May also came to power and would really shake things up. Uh, and, and be uh, certainly somebody who the, the British would look at as a savior figure um, for, their, for their nation. Um, he was capable of rallying Britain to uh, his cause uh, through spellbinding speeches uh, and then also just uh, determination that never flags. Um, we start to see um, after the Battle of France, right, then we see the Battle of Britain um, as Hitler tries to conquer Britain by launching a massive air attack over the English Channel. 
Um, and this occurs from June through September. Uh, but the Royal Air Force, in um, you know, a storied effort that many historians have, have written about and lots of movies made and that sort of thing, uh, kind of a, a feel-good story um, in the end, uh, this attack here and this, this resistance combined uh, outnumbered but, far, but superior British planes, uh, masterful use of radar and code breaking by the British, and then an impassioned defense of their homes. Really, this was sort of this last-ditch, uh, you know, claw, um, claw and tooth uh, effort by the Britons. Uh, and they were able to temporarily secure Britain uh, and then uh, make the frustrated Germans shift their emphasis to um, the USSR, this colossus of Eastern Europe. Well, uh, it's interesting because um, Hitler, even though he had shifted his emphasis, continued uh, the blitz um, on, on Britain, which would last all the way through May 41, uh, which uh, would include bombing of towns and cities. And really, this was directed at civilians. These weren't just military targets. This was try he was trying to take the heart and soul away from the British people to make them not want to fight. Uh, and uh, truly, some uh, sad times, and 43,000 um, were killed, uh, civilians. Uh, anyway, U.S., while all this is going on, um, you know, uh, was limiting imports and exports to reflect its support of the Allies. It was building up its military stores and repairing its own defenses in the, in the, in the case that it needed to, to fight. Um, and then uh, we see the Selective Service. You may have heard of that. Uh, passed the Selective Service Training and Service Act in 40 to prepare for a potential draft. Um, and then it builds itself as the arsenal of democracy in that speech which you read uh, in December of 1940. And then by March of 41, um, FDR signed the Lend-Lease Act, which authorized selling, transferring, lending, or leasing of arms and other supplies to allied nations. Um, we see on September 27, 1940, Germany, Italy, and Japan signed the Tripartite Pact, in which they basically uh, agree to formally um, support the new order of the world that Germany and Italy were trying to create in Europe and that Japan was trying to create in East Asia, and also agreeing that they would, be, they would bound they would uh, bind themselves together, uh, ally together, if any power, such as the U.S., uh, might enter the war in the future. So this was their precaution against the U.S., which was sort of the sleeping giant at this point. Um, okay, so with, with that background, and I, and I truly hope that this will help us to have um, a, a great discussion today, um, let's take a look at the Ober-Salzburg speech and, and, and do some foreoring. Um, I want you to reason. Uh, what does Hitler say about Mussolini and Stalin? Um, Let's start with that question first. Well, he says besides himself that, it, that they are the only other two great statesmen. Mm -hmm. But he also says Mussolini is weak and kind of hopes Stalin will die soon. So right. <laughs> even though he says they're the best out there, he still doesn't think very highly of them. Yeah, definitely. Excellent, right? And, and, and sort of going hand in hand with that, right? What is, what is he... Uh, say about, you know, other world leaders. This is very interesting. He talks about, oh, the leaders of Turkey and Romania, Belgium, Norway, Japan, England. Oh, I think oh he says they're half idiots. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, he talks about gonna... each one of their weaknesses, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, Walter, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say uh, that uh, I think he says that uh, like Turkey, Belgium, and uh, Norway, and some other countries, I think he says that, that their people are eat too much and are lazy and mm -hmm. slothful and yeah. Yeah, definitely, right? I mean, he's just very, very derogatory. Uh, you know, he, he talks about the emperor as, as weak and cowardly and undecided, you know, etc. Um, and so definitely, as we think about this, I mean, what, what kind of a guy is Hitler? What would you reason? Untrustworthy. Mm -hmm. Sure, untrustworthy, definitely. Um, I think it's it's uh, interesting here. Going along with that, what about his tactics? From from your reading, what would you reason about his tactics? What does he say that, that Germany will do and that he that he will do? He says we need to be more brutal than others. Mm -hmm. More quick, without yeah. mercy, more brutal than anyone else. And also, I wanted to say as far as 
what he was like. He was he was really good at fault finding. Mm -hmm. You see that with his paper we read about, you know, what he had to say about the Jews, and then also just here, you know, oh, they're such idiots. So sort of like nobody can do anything right but him. Yeah, definitely, and and I think that is a that is a great a great way to put it, Heidi. Thank you so much for that comment. Uh, here, you know, certainly you just see this this uh, this sick um, mind talks about how you know we need to have uh, relentless, uh, you know. Uh, well, we need to fight relentlessly and without compassion to send into death many women and children of Polish origin and language. So really, he's a guy who just doesn't seem to have a heart. Uh, and, and it's just so sad that he, he you know, um, couldn't have been more in touch with his um, kind side, to put it um, one way. Well, what about his plans for Poland? Because, of course, you know, the, whole, the main point of this is to really sort of announce his plans for Poland. Uh, what are those plans? Just like Heidi said, brutal, quick attack. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And, um, and is he going to be alone? Well, Russia's coming from the other side, aren't they? That, that's right, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, so he, he has agreed right, to do this with Stalin. Right? They've signed the pact at this point. Um, and so uh, because of that, uh, he knows that his plans are, hey, we'll invade first, and then Russia, the USSR, will invade next, and so we'll sort of take them out together. Um, and so it's interesting because even though right, he doesn't think very highly of Stalin, even though he thinks more highly of him than some others, right, he, he still um, is using him to his advantage. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's something that we see in uh, wicked leaders a lot. Right? They'll use people and then throw them away. Okay, um, well, if we then take a look and we do some relating, uh, what principles would you say governed Hitler's leadership at the beginning of World War II? What were some principles? Well, I would throw them out there. What principles governed his leadership? If, if, he, if he were a book, you know, the, 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 highly, the, the seven habits of you know, highly effective people, you know, what would they be for him? Uh, pride. Pride, uh-huh. I think kind of the principle or the saying that it's better to be feared than to be loved. I think he probably believes that. Yeah, yeah. Machiavelli, definitely, right? Better to be feared than to be loved. Mm -hmm. I would say taking care of our own and not worrying about others. Mm -hmm. Because he's so concerned about the Germans having enough, you know, land mass where he says, let's just depopulate Poland and settle it with Germans. Yeah, so definitely, like, well, right? As long as we're taking care of, you know, the ends justify the means. That would yeah. be part of his principles. Excellent, Heidi. I think he used a lot of flattery. Flattery, great. Yep. Flattery, lies, deceit, yep. sure, right? Yep. Um, definitely. I think it's it's just so interesting. Uh, you know, just love that love that quote that sort of in his uh, you know in in who he was and in what he did, uh, to paraphrase, right? Nobody was closer to Satan himself than, than Hitler. That's from President Packer, you know, uh, and, and we can see that. So uh, certainly, I think, you know, force, right, certainly external versus internal, right? It's all about force. This isn't, oh, yeah, well, let's see if the people will come around to it themselves. This is, no, 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 we'll, we'll do it. We'll, we'll make them um, to get my way. Uh, well, if we think about this, right, how might we, and of course, not nearly to the same level, not even close, but at the same time, think about it. If Satan is at the root of this, well, when we sin, he's also at the root of what we do. Uh, so how might we be tempted to use similar principles in our leadership? Why? Why might we do it? Well, we'd probably do it to get what we thought we wanted. Sure. And just by the means, right? I mean, hey, if that's really what I want and I think that I deserve it, you know, I'm better than other people, uh, then I'll, I'll just do it. Force, force is quick and easy a lot of the time, right? Um, and so, certainly. Uh, what else? And yeah, why, why might it be think, tempting? Well, I think definitely like what you're saying, the ease, it's a lot easier to use force than it is to try to slowly convince someone and to teach them correct principles. It's just much easier, just like with our kids, oh, fine, I'll just do it myself. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it's frustrating to try to do it slow. Yeah, definitely. You know, and, and I, I, uh, yesterday was very interesting because uh, we, there was, a, there was a, a middle school soccer, soccer game and... Um, Anyway, the, 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 uh, the lines in the field, they were done um, uh, by, by a student. And, you know, I could have done them myself, but yet we're trying to teach self-governance. We had uh, an opportunity to, 
to help a student um, uh, do some do some work. And you know, I was I was really happy to know that hey, the student was able to do this rather than me, even though I did it you know all last season. But I think this is a great thing to have to have uh, it be done, even if maybe if it's not done exactly the way I might have done it myself, you know. But the fact is, that it's teaching a lesson, um, and probably a lot more worthwhile than me just getting it done quickly. Well, what do we think then? If we compare, of course, uh, Satan, you know, or Hitler as this sort of type of, of Satan, you know, what can we do to, to be like Christ, to lead like Christ? I like how in the quiz um, how you referred to DNC 121 and just the, the, the principles that the priesthood should be used for. I think those are all ways that Christ leads through persuasion and meekness and only using, you know, um, sharpness in a moment, but then you know, extend more love afterwards. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for that. In fact, uh, I actually wanted to look at those because, you know, even though they are specifically talking about the priesthood, uh, they are wonderful principles that can easily translate over into other types of leadership, not just priesthood leadership. Uh, and so I want you to just take a look at this page. We're not going to read it out loud, but take, take a moment, read it to yourself, um, and then let's try to relate it, right? What are those principles of righteous, Christ-like leadership? What are those principles? So take a moment. Look at this, and then uh, tell me what you think. I've got two slides. This is the, the first one. We'll talk after each. I think this first the scripture passage kind of confirms what we've already been talking about, that Hitler's um, methods were completely against God's methods, and if any um, use those methods, they are left to themselves. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for that. What else would we say? Can you repeat the question? Sure. Um, what principles of righteous leadership do we see in here? Or what would righteous leaders not do? Motive is, is really key. Mm -hmm. um, you know, going back to the war in heaven, Satan was saying that the glory be mine. And, you know, that, that I guess, was probably 50% of the problem, uh, along with taking away people's free agency. But motive is a big deal. And so it lists some things that are, that are the wrong motives to cover our sins, to gratify our pride. Mm -hmm. to do something out of ambition, and to have your heart set upon the things of the world, to aspire to the honors of men, to exercise control. These are all things um, that a leader should not have as a motive at all. Yeah, excellent. Excellent, Wendy. I, I really appreciate that comment. You know, I just, as I, as I think about this, I always am just so drawn to this last part, you know, which really sums up everything you were saying, that, you know, why is it that? If the nature and disposition of almost all men, as soon as they get a little authority, as they suppose, right, uh, they will immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. Uh, and so, of course, right, a righteous leader would be able to fight against that, that tendency, not give in to it. Um, well, okay, of course, here, this is the more famous part of uh, Doctrine and Covenants 121 about leadership. Um, what would we think here? Take a moment to just look at these principles. And what are these? What are the principles of righteous leadership, Christ-like leadership? Well, just the fact of having charity towards all men, I would say that that was pretty much the opposite of how Hitler felt towards other people. Yeah. I mean, you might be able to argue, well, he had charity towards the German people, but he really didn't because he lifted them up in his own pride. Mm -hmm. I think he was using them in a way, too, to gratify his, to gratify his own pride. More than sure. he was probably to help them. Mm -hmm. That's a great point, Heidi. 
What do you think, Walter? Do you see any righteous principles of leadership in here? Things that righteous leaders will do. Uh, well, uh, this is this first one? Um, well, I don't really get the first part, but I just the second part only by persuasion, by long suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned. And so, um, I think that's just saying that uh, uh, power and influence needs to be a uh, needs to be, you need to, to keep power and influence, you need to have long suffering and just those things they say there. So I think that's... Yeah, yeah thank you so much. Uh, you know, and I, and I love how as, as, we, as we do those things that you're talking about, Walter, that, uh, you know, our confidence can wax strong um, in the presence of God and we'll be able to qualify for great blessings such as uh, the Holy Ghost being our constant companion, uh, if we're members of the church, uh, or certainly uh, some inspiration, at least, if we're living the right way, if we're, if we're not members of the church, right, and we can follow that light of Christ, then that can also be a, a conscience in helping us make decisions, too. Um, well, lots of great things, and I appreciate those comments. Well, it's interesting. If we look at the Franco-German uh, armistice, um, there's actually a lot in there. We don't have to necessarily spend tons of time on it, but there's really a lot in there, uh, and so I'm not sure um, how, how you read it, but... Um, what does it say, uh, explicitly or implicitly, um, about these different things here? What would you say? Uh, the result of Hitler's Blitzkrieg, uh, the German occupation, the Vichy government, which was that government to be set up in the unoccupied territory, the Free French forces, or the forces um, fighting, uh, the French forces that would fight from without, or the resistance that carried on the war from within. What do, what do you think? What, what does that um, document have to do with any of these? I didn't really get um, the third point out of it. Um, you know, it talked about a government in occupied territory, but I had no idea that it was a puppet government or anything like that. But, but right. clearly on the other points, you know, you could pick out that, that France had lost, that the Blitzkrieg had succeeded, that German, um, Germany was occupying a portion of France. I don't know how big it was. I can't really get that out of it. But, um, but they basically gave away all their rights, you know, it just doesn't, it just, I mean, it just goes on and on and on, stop doing this, stop doing this, it just, it, it, it sounds like surrender. Yeah, yeah, definitely, and, and, and that it is, uh, and, you know, just to help connect some dots, um, the, uh, the document talks about how France would have to give lots and lots of its, um, you know, military stores, you know, uh, you know, ships, planes, uh, ammunition, uh, guns, you know, etc., um, over to the Germans, and one of the things that this Vichy government uh, did was it helped in the administration of getting those things to the German army, to Hitler, uh, and so it was this puppet government uh, in really administering the terms of this armistice, uh, and so it's very, it, it's just a sad chapter in, in um, France's history, not only for losing, but then because we see uh, Marshal Pétain, uh, you know, in his 80s, he was a World War I hero, uh, and then he becomes this authoritarian, um, pro-German collaborationist, uh, you know, just sort of uh, by force, but, but also by choice. Um, and it's just such a sad chapter to see uh, as we see France collaborating with Germany in this way. And, and you know, of course, they were sort of had a, had a gun to their head, figuratively speaking. Um, but we see um, this, this Vichy government um, fighting against its own people. Um, those who tried to be liberationists uh, in the resistance, uh, fighting against, um, you know, those who, those who would support the, the free French under de Gaulle. Uh, and so the Vichy government was uh, incredibly unpopular and, and to this day is just a sore spot, uh, you know, in, in France's history. Um, anyway, the, the, free, the free French were, were, uh, were pretty inept and uh, there weren't much of a fighting force, uh, but they, they went around and helped the Allies through various battles in the war. Uh, outside of France, and then eventually when the Allies liberated France, de Gaulle would ride in and uh, be the leader and then would lead France for decades afterwards. Uh, and the resistance movement, uh, which is an interesting period, a lot's been written about it, it's kind of been romanticized, uh, but certainly uh, it became more and more effective uh, just as sort of the communists 
uh, were effective at disrupting uh, total Japanese control, uh, the French resistance movement was also effective uh, on carrying the war from the inside out. Um, if we look at this, right, we have this great story that I thought of, of Bohorin, Moroni, uh, and then the King Man, right, from Alma 61. Um, you probably know the story, but just refreshing yourself by taking a glimpse at these verses, um, how do you think that this might relate? If you think of the Vichy government, if you think of the resistance, if you think of uh, the Germans, the Free French, any relations? Uh, well, I think it has a relation to the, um, the resistance because mm -hmm. uh, the kingmen were kind of were really stopping the the new fight um, uh, military uh, operations due to um, uh, stopping everything on the inside. It's, that's kind of what the resistance was doing. Is they were stopping um, how the Germans in, were working in France on the inside. Yeah, definitely, right? And, and certainly, I mean, you know, we don't want to uh, overextend the analogy, but uh, we might think of it as, you know, the king man. The king man is sort of the, almost like this, this Vichy government uh, supporting the king, supporting Hitler uh, in a way, uh, but yet they're coming from the inside. They're French, but yet they're fighting against um, uh, freedom in France. Uh, and then we see uh, the true leaders like uh, Pehorin, um, who are calling for help, uh, who are trying to stay true, uh, calling for help from Moroni, just as, uh, sort of the French would call for help from the outside from de Gaulle, who was leading the Free French. And so we can kind of see some, some similarities. And, uh, you know, I, I love this here in this, this second page here is, uh, as we look at some, some uh, quotes from it. Um, but Horn, as he's writing, he says, you know, uh, we would not shed the blood of our brethren if they had not risen up in rebellion and, and then taken the sword against us. Also, he said, you know, we would subject uh, ourselves to the yoke of bondage if it were requisite with the justice of God or if he should command us so to do. But, behold, he doth not command us that we shall subject ourselves to our enemies, but that we should put our trust in him, and he will deliver us. Uh, and then he talks about resisting the evil together with Moroni, uh, calling him in to help. Um, and, and, I, and I love this here, and I love how um, you know, we, we get to learn that um, the spirit of God is also the spirit of freedom, which was in these freedom fighters. Um, and, and I think that's certainly something to, uh, interesting to think about. Um, any, any, any thoughts about, about how that might relate to uh, France? Hello? 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 Oh, hi. Did, did, um, any, any other thoughts about how this might relate to France? Resisting evil, but can I ask a question um, about who is, is Vichy a person? I, I, I guess oh, it's not uh, Marshall. No, so so Vichy was actually a spa town. It was a vacation community in southern France, and that was where the government moved to. Uh, and so, because it was the location of this new government, um, it, they named it the Vichy government. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's a great question, Wendy. Okay, well, if we look at this, the Arsenal Democracy speech here. Um, what does FDR talk about in terms of the, the U.S. position regarding World War II? Remember, this is December 1940. What is the position of the U.S. at this time? They're still neutral. Aren't yep. They? Yes, neutrality. You got it. Um, and it's interesting because uh, Roosevelt says that, hey, don't, don't say we're not neutral uh, because, uh, and, I, and I think this is an interesting quote, he said here, you know, um, it is no more unneutral for us to do that, meaning help, um, then it is for Sweden, Russia, and other nations near Germany to send steel and ore and oil and other war materials into Germany every day of the week, even though uh, you know, Sweden proclaimed neutrality and Russia was uh, neutral at this time and that sort of thing. Anyway, so yeah, so definitely neutral, but in, in kind of an unneutral way, but neutral. Uh, okay, what do you think, though, about um, the arsenal of democracy? What are the two ways that F FDR wants the U.S. to be an arsenal of democracy? wants them to supply uh, uh, weapons and uh, ammunition and uh, just other supplies to Britain. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That's the first way. And what's the second way? 
and also to uh, uh, just build up uh, weapons and ammunition uh, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, right? So uh, help, help the cause without and then also uh, prepare within. Uh, I love he, he says here, you know, the people of Europe who are defending themselves do not ask us to do their fighting. They ask us for the implements of war, the planes, the tanks, the guns, the freighters, which will enable them to fight for their liberty and for our security. Emphatically, we must get these weapons to them in sufficient volume and quickly enough so that we and our children will be saved the agony and suffering of war, which others have had to endure. Uh, well, what about, um, let's see, Britain at this point. How, how does FDR view Britain? What does uh, he call he, them? He, uh, he says they're the spearhead of... Uh, 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 did you say fascist or fascist or um, German resistance or something like that? Yeah, yeah, you're really close. The spearhead of resistance to world conquest. Definitely talking about how they're putting up a fight which will live forever in the story of human gallantry. Uh, and then what did he say about sending American troops to World War II at this time? No intention whatsoever. That's right. No intention whatsoever. Uh, talks about how uh, there is no demand for sending an American expeditionary force outside of our own borders, uh, and there is no intention by any member of your government to send such a force. Um, okay, well, if we look about that, we think about preparation, because, of course, right, there was this huge preparation effort uh, in the United States. Um, take a look at this, uh, this great scripture here, uh, and, and how does it relate to our spiritual preparation? Of course, one of the famous lessons from the war chapters in Alma, um, how, does, how do they relate to our spiritual preparation? I like how Moroni is preparing um, just so that if anything were to happen, they would be ready, and that's what we should always be doing spiritually. We don't know what battles or what wars that Satan will wage against us personally, or whether the ones he's waging against in the world will affect us personally. So we always have to be ready, and that's what Mom and I was doing physically. Yeah, definitely. And, and I love how, you know, he prepared the mind uh, of the people, right, um, as well as he then strengthened the armies, right? So really, he's covering all the bases. Uh, thanks so much for that great comment, Christina. What did we say about the importance of, of preparation? Well, it's also interesting in this first paragraph that it's talking about Amalekiah is getting people um, ready to fight physically, and Moroni is preparing the mind. So he's trying to change people's hearts and get them on a spiritual plane where Amalekiah is more worried about, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Kind of tells us where we need to put more of our focus, more in a spiritual preparedness over war preparations, even though that's important too. It talks about that also, but it's more important to stay close to the Lord so so we can know when he's leading us, if he does tell us to go to war. Uh, definitely, right? Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I appreciate that comment, Heidi. Well, if we look at this, this last speech then, um, do some reasoning together here, uh, the, their finest hour speech uh, from the 18th of June, 1940. Uh, first of all, um, let's see here. What does is, what is Churchill say Britain is fighting for? What's Britain fighting for? I thought it was very interesting to see what he said about it. Um, the Christian civilization. Yeah, Christian civilization, right? For the survival of Christian civilization. Yeah. Anything else? The British life, the continuity of our institutions and our empire. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, so certainly, right, this battle after France has fallen, and he's basically saying, you know, this is down to the last man. We have to, you know, give everything to, to, save, to save our nation at this point um, because uh, Hitler is coming. Um, and uh, certainly, you know, a moment of desperation, a moment to sort of stand and be counted uh, as, as he portrays it. Um, and so what does he mean by finest hour? And why would Britain's fight against Germany at this time mean so much? Um, he uh, says it's the finest hour because uh, they are 
the only ones fighting against Germany really at this time. And um, that's also why it meant so much that they're fighting against Germany. And uh, it's just uh, fight, the finest hour because it's it's just the uh, um, uh, just uh, kind of to inspire people, and it's uh, just yeah, you know, uh. yeah, yeah. It's a great, a great answer, Walter, and I appreciate it. Um, you're doing a great job today. Um, you know, it's it's it, it's interesting just to think about. Remember, uh, you know, I gave that context to you, and and certainly we we see. Uh, the, uh, the the British uh, planes, the Air Force, the RAF, uh, you know, vastly outnumbered, but yet, you know, putting up this fight uh, for for home and uh, for their families and for uh, you know their religion, um, and uh, truly, you know, this is uh, one of those poignant moments um, of of, uh, of history uh, as 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 we study it. Uh, well, what do you think? Do you, do you think that this speech was effective at achieving its purpose? Well, I would say yes. I'm sure that it helped the people rise up and want to protect their land and realize that, I mean, they sort of felt like they were fighting for the, what does he say here at the very bottom? Let's see. Um, if we can stand up to him, then all Europe may be free. So they felt like they were kind of the last defense of all of Europe. Right. And the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. Mm -hmm. And if we fail then the whole world, including the United States, and all that we have cared for will sink into the abyss of a new dark age. So yeah, I think so they certainly. sort of feel like they were the last stronghold, you know, even though I know that's what Reagan says about the United States, but they feel like they were for at least Europe and possibly the world. Yeah, definitely. And so, of course, right, that's a, that's a, a powerful, uh, you know, reason for sort of... Uh, mobilizing for war, you know, pulling on the heartstrings, uh, you know, he was a gifted orator, you know, because of, of what we see here, uh, able to mobilize people uh, in, in sort of the hour of need. Well, as we think about this, and, and I want to think about, let's just skip to this last one for the sake of time here, we think about holding on, because really Churchill was asking them, you know, hold on, don't give up, keep fighting, we can do it, right? Well, spiritually, of course, uh, in our own lives today, this is 1940, Right, but it's you know 2010, and we all are fighting our own battles, uh, private or public. Um, and as as we do that, you know, we too need to take hope. But we need to take it from um, the atonement of Christ, right? From Christ, whom uh, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland called a high priest of good things to come. Of this, a quote from from Hebrews, but uh, this is the name of his talk here. Um, and, and I love this quote. He talks about it that. Um, they sustain us, meaning the Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, they sustain us in our hour of need and always will, even if we cannot recognize that intervention. Some blessings come soon, some come late, and some don't come until heaven. But for those who embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, they come. Of that I personally attest. Uh, and then he closes with his testimony. Um, what do we think about that? How does this relate to us today? Well, I see a lot of relation to us. I'm sorry, Wendy. I was just going to say, I see a lot of relation to us today, but I'm not really finding how it relates to what we're talking about. So maybe Wendy has a better idea. Well, I, I'm actually, I'd actually like to relate this to ourselves today, just because the relation is that just as, you know, Churchill was trying to uh, mobilize uh, an effort that seemed all but lost, I think there are times in our own lives where we need to try to muster our own effort when all seems lost. Uh, and so I, I, I am happy to talk about today. Well, I have to think, I, I think one of Satan's biggest tools, at least in my life, is discouragement. And that sometimes you feel like you're living the gospel, you're doing all these things, and yet you don't feel like you necessarily see the rewards, or you don't always, I don't know, get an immediate answer to your prayer. And so this is a very nice promise. You know, I think a lot of times we have to say, 
Well, that blessing is has that blessing will come. It just hasn't come yet. Ah, and so that, that really taps into our faith of whether you think it really is going to happen or not. Ah, right, and that that helps us to have the hope we need to carry on. Wendy, what were you going to say? Oh, nothing in addition. To, you, I think you've covered it. Are you I'm sure? Just going to say that when when all when all seems hopeless. Um, you know, I always think of Mormon Moroni fighting that last battle for the Nephites when they knew there was no hope. But mm -hmm. they did it anyway because they were earning their rewards in heaven. They, they knew the external battle was lost. And I often feel that in my own life. Um, but I, but I, know, I know I'm doing the right thing. I know, I know, I know the reward will come. Uh, thank you so much for that. And, you know, I, I always appreciate um, your participation, Wendy. And, uh, everybody else's. I just uh, I always learn so much and feel strengthened uh, from um, the comments that are made in this class. And so thank uh, thank all of you for that. Um, well, I look I look forward to our, our continued classes about World War II. Uh, thank you so much again for everything today, and I hope you have a great day. Um, and I, I look forward to our class then on Tuesday. Bye everybody. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Hi. Oh, hi Mia. How are you? Who are you talking to? Oh, I was talking to the student. Oh, how precious. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, sweetie. Love you. Mia, bye-bye. You too. Love you. Sorry, bye. I love you. Bye. <laughs>